Welcome to the Look Good, Move Well podcast. Okay, FBB banter. Um, let's see. We are... What do we got? What do you got? <laughs> Nate, what do you got? <laughs> ah. What are we doing this week? What are you doing this weekend? Oh, I am the wrong person to ask that. Yeah, no, it is. Just say it. Say it. It's doing nothing. I'm staying at home. I'm working. No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how's that going? Uh, terrible. Terrible? <laughs> it's been two weekends. <laughs> two weekends. Haven't yet done any non-work things. Yeah. I just, I tend to crash at the end of the week. But yeah. I do I do have plans this weekend. I know. Semi. Um, no, there's this really funny comedian, and this was the same thing that I did last time I did something on a weekend but she does these like live stream shows whenever her oh, live yeah. comedy shows get canceled and she's really really funny so I'm probably going to do another one of those tonight. oh hell yeah yeah well I have my uh what is it do the math on that six year wedding anniversary on Sunday heck yeah congratulations heck yeah so we may, we're making it we're making it work six years um, and we're going to go to, uh, a dinner, a, like a late lunch in, um, in Oakland, uh, on, on Sunday with, uh, yeah, some friends. So looking forward to that. And, uh, it's kind of, uh, reliving some of the wedding, wedding memories. It's yeah. kind of, it was fun. We had a, we had a, we got married on a Kauai, Hawaiian Island and we had like maybe... I think we ended up having like 50 people that flew out for it, which was pretty amazing. I didn't expect that many people to come. Part of the reason of having it that far away was, you know, we knew it would just maybe limit the guest list a little bit. And um, so not that we didn't want to have people there, but, you know, we at the time owned a gym and we had a lot of friends locally. And we were like, oh, if we have a wedding here in Marin, like, how are we going to, how are we going to? cut the list off like mm -hmm. at some point you know it's going to be like 300 people so anyway it was really special and we did something very cool that day it was called and many people probably have heard this but a silent disco oh yeah yeah it's like everybody gets this set of headphones and the dj plays you know the music through the headphones not over like big speakers um and part of that was because there was like a noise ordinance where we had like the venue and there was also a curfew, and so we could listen to the music a little later if it was through the thing, through the headset. But um, it's one of the coolest experiences if 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 you haven't ever been to a silent disco or you haven't done that, because you're just like having headphones on, like you can just connect so much more to the music itself. Like there's not you know ambient sounds that you're trying to like you don't hear people screaming, and anytime you want to like a break from the music, you just take the headphones off, and you're just it's kind of quiet. But everyone else is still jamming to the music and dancing. And what's super funny is when you take, you know, the headphones off, everyone's singing to the music, <laughs> but they're not they're not being drowned out by the actual sounds of the of the real artist. And so you hear everyone singing just out of tune and just then <laughs> they don't care because they can't hear themselves and it's just fun. So I remember it being a, a good a good time. I think the you know, it's always been talk of recreating that in some some setting, some venue. But um, maybe at the new house, we'll have a big, you know, silent disco rager in the backyard and uh, not piss off the neighbors. Yeah, sounds yeah. fun. Okay. All right. Okay. We've 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 killed enough time. We've bantered okay. enough. We've now bantered. We're get into it. What are we talking about, Sophia? Okay, let's talk about mobility. We have so much to cover. We do. Oh yeah. Fantastic. So many questions. Fantastic. Yeah. I love and it. I love it because we talk about mobility pretty frequently but yeah. there's still areas to uncover and uh people still have many questions and as i was reading through the questions that were coming in i was like oh yeah that's totally a good one yeah we should totally talk about that okay let's okay. fire away okay so first thing i just want to paint the picture because 
we have been developing mobility within our functional bodybuilding programs. Yeah. And it's it's something that we've always had in one way or another. We've always had a very intentional warm up that has been the heart and soul of FPB to really prepare you for the training to come and to mm-hmm. pay attention to how your body's moving through space. We're all about look good, move well, and the move well part certainly hinges on having good mobility. Yeah. You always have very good mobility, Marcus. It's well, admirable. Thank you. Yep. So I think that it's been more intentional lately now that we've yeah. added a physical therapist to our team who's doing some more really detailed notes in the warm ups that we've been giving to our group programs around like here's your actual intention for this piece mm-hmm. and here's the part where you have like a really good stretch after your training and yeah. get into all these areas. So it's just started to evolve my thinking about mobility more and I think also I'm seeing that in some of the questions coming in. So maybe we can just do a little, we can do a a rapid fire, but we can also pause and dig into some of the ones that are juicier questions. Yeah, I like that. We'll do a rapid fire, but I want to give a little, another contextual uh, opener, which is that I think we're, I don't know how many years it's been since this mobility renaissance has been Mm -hmm. kind of happening. But I think it's in it's in kind of a second stage or a third stage of it, where first you saw a lot of people just open the conversation about mobility. People like Kelly Starrett, who started Mobility Wad a number of years back, that was really groundbreaking. And it really got people thinking about, you know, the shapes and the positions that our bodies should be getting into that these are our this is our birthright to have access to these things and we've lost them, so how do we reclaim them? Um, and then there were you know, this, the era of like the, the ROM wads and the stretch along, uh, programs, which are still very prevalent today, but it was like, Hey, go do your training, go do whatever you're doing, but then come to us and we're going to give you something to follow along with. That's going to just allow you to sort of generally keep everything open. And now, um, I think that this third wave, as I see it, so it was like develop the language about it. Kelly crushed it and he's been crushing it for, for a decade, you know, then give people some, some tools that they can just follow along because if they don't want to like investigate the language and learn it, they just want to follow something great. But now what I'm seeing, and I've been seeing it for a little bit is the concept where we're saying, where we're seeing that there's a blend of like, you don't just stretch you actually strengthen and stretch and truly when you when you think of, when when you actually do mobility correctly it's strength training they're one in the same there's no difference when you mobilize without weights versus when you mobilize with weights and mobilizing without weights is still against resistance and there've been some very influential people in that on that front One of which is, you know, we've talked about him many. We've had collaborations with Ben Patrick, but Ben is promoting a knee ability program, how to make stronger knees. But his approach is essentially a very uh, well thought out mobility program. Mobilize the ankles, the, the feet, the ankles, the knees, the hips, the upper body with strengthening protocols through full ranges of motion and in a progressive way regress it down progress it up that's strength training but it's with a mobility bias or emphasis and now there's more and more individuals that are looking at mobility as strength training and i know that if i were to go back we were go back and talk to kelly 10 years ago he'd be like yeah that's obvious that's what we're doing um it's just a way that the conversation is happening that feels different to me and I think feels different for other people and they want to understand, oh, how do these fit together? And that is what we're working on so diligently with functional bodybuilding is to say, okay, it look good, move well. Like the move well portion of this, it means that we do strength training through big ranges of motion because that enhances mobility, that improves your posture, that improves your likelihood of being injury free and feeling good. And we're not going to sacrifice that just for a few extra pounds on the bar or a few more reps. Great. So that actually brings up 
a question that I wanted to pose to you to help clarify this, because I think that it helps to give the context of how we approach mobility within functional bodybuilding. And one of the questions was, well, what's the difference between the type of mobility we're doing and yoga? Ah, oh, they're um, hmm, great. Well, with yoga, I, I'm not an expert on, on all the different yoga practices that are out there. Um, I've had some experience with yoga and there's, uh, in the experiences that I've had, um, I think that yoga is pretty much on the same continuum of what we're doing as well. That I don't, I, I, I haven't done a lot of yoga that includes and incorporates at least um, external load or resistance. So I, I haven't done a yoga... I've never seen really much yoga where you like hold weights or anything like that. Um, you hold body weight positions for sure, and you can hold very challenging body weight positions. And so inside of yoga, there could be strengthening, there could be handstands, there could be, you know, a variety of different, you know, even downward dog held in, you know, uh, for durations is, you know, resistance training on the shoulders. So there's some strengthening that happens there. Um, but for a lot of it, it's it, there's a there's a passive st stretching component, and there's a connection to breath. And if using your breath to c control or to open up the nervous system to expand to different, you know, ranges of motion, that's part of what I've experienced through yoga. These are all things that also find their way into functional bodybuilding. Um, there's Again, maybe maybe this would be a uh, like if if the goal would be, and again, I'm not the expert here on yoga, but you know, hey, we're gonna do this position to stretch this muscle. Um, well, in our environment, we're gonna do this position to stretch. You know, we're gonna try and mobilize a position because that position has carryover to, I don't know, something in life or to an exercise that we want to strengthen. So we're going to strengthen the bottom or we're going to mobilize the bottom of our squat, the, this squat position, because we want to be able to squat pain-free uh, for heavier loads to build strength and resilience in our hips and our back and our knees. Um, but we also incorporate external load to enhance our mobility by loading our body at end range, uh, which builds uh, strength in those positions and solidifies to our brain that, hey, the end of this lunge where, you know, I might feel otherwise vulnerable now is strengthened by being able to do deep knee over toe split squats or lunges at 50 pounds. And so my body is confident to go there and stay strong in that position. Great. Yeah. And it was really interesting to hear the kinds of things that people wanted better mobility for, because mm -hmm. we asked this recently, and some of them were certainly sport specific, where people want a pistol squat, they want to have overhead squatting, they want to be able to do a snatch. And that's, I think, motivating in a certain way, if you're into sport, there's another category of people that want better mobility for life things. Yeah. And so... One question that came up was, well, how do I, where do I even start of stepping back and just saying like, well, what do I need and how do I develop a mobility program around that? Yeah. Well, for the sport stuff, it's maybe a little bit more straightforward because you just look at the demands of the sport. You look at the positions that the sport wants you to be in and then you can evaluate, well, how good am I in those positions? So if you do a lot of like, um, Let's say you're like doing a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Well, that that demands certain positions, you know, like when you're grappling and you're on the ground and you're trying to do certain submissions, you know, being able to externally rotate your hip and bring, you know, think about just like sitting with your like legs crossed. Well, you need to be able to bring that foot all the way, your ankle, like really close to your chest, your torso, if you're going to do a... I guess it's called like a triangle choke or I don't know all the different submissions, but, you know, to get a, a, an opponent into a position and apply leverage using your own leg, well, that you need to be able to do like a really aggressive 
you know, stretched position there with strength. So you would look at your sport and say, okay, that's what I need to work on. And then you build kind of a mobility plan or, you know, an approach to how do I strengthen and, and enhance that range of motion for the life stuff. That's, it's a little harder. It's like you could try and evaluate, well, what are the positions of my life? But most people's day-to-day -day lives don't take them to extreme ranges of motion. What ends up happening is that they end up not moving very much. They're in limited ranges of motion. And because they're habitually in limited ranges of motion, the body loses the uh, stimulus to like enhance and keep those end ranges of motion very healthy and the tissues healthy. And so they start to move through life. They just get a little bit stiffer. They're not moving very much. And that creates shitty tissue and shitty tissue starts to hurt and starts to feel vulnerable. So it's more like, okay, well, we got to evaluate all of your global movement patterns and you know, you don't have to get so nuanced and specific. You can just sort of say, okay, well, how, you know, look at the shoulder, like how well does it extend and how well does it flex? Let's look at the, you know, the hip, how well does it extend? How well does it flex? So that's like touch your toes or do a couch stretch, you know, uh, for the shoulder. It's like, okay, put your arms behind you, clasp your hands and how high can you reach your arms versus like, okay, reach your arm over your head. How high can you reach your arms with a straight arm and without arching your back? Um, these are just basic evalu evaluations. And then you can start to look at like the, the knee joint, like how much flexion do you have at the knee joint? Um, and again, that's a very crude way of just assessing it, but you don't even have to really do that too like thoughtfully to be able to identify where you have deficits and be mm -hmm. like oh i'm tight here or i'm tight there we kind of look we kind of address this in our training in our approach to training it's like well these are like the five very general movement patterns that we see we want to be able to do you know we want to work this side of the joint we want to work that side of the joint there's strength protocols on both sides of the joint there's also flexibility protocols on both sides of the joint and let's make sure we hit each a couple days a week at a bare minimum to try and enhance some of those positions. So you could get very detailed and do like a full evaluation with, you know, one of our strength coaches and get a, a very global assessment of your movement and your mobility. Or you could say, all right, I'm going to take kind of this shotgun approach and I'm just going to do a little bit for each area once or twice a week. And in doing that, you will notice very quickly, wow, this position really sucks for me. Mm -hmm. Like if you follow the persist warm ups for a week or the cool downs for a week, you'll see, okay, Mondays I did lower body. I felt great. Tuesday we did upper body cool down. I did those two stretches. Dang, I was tight. Okay, that's starting to talk to you. Those are the areas that you really have some maybe deficits that you could work on. And the benefit or the payoff is if I open those up, then there's going to be less and less downstream dysfunction, pain, stiffness, and I'm going to be able to get into better positions in my my day-to-day -day life or my training, which is going to make me more resilient and more robust. And that is the mentality I've had for five, ten years. Is just like, I just want to get better positions so that when I train, I can get into better positions. And then I'm like, eight years ago, I used to complain of back pain most days. Mm -hmm. And now I don't complain of back pain because I followed this formula for long enough where I've just built resilience around these positions and then reinforce them with good strength training. Yeah. I was on the internet <laughs> <laughs> as I often am. <laughs> and uh, I was in a little room where people were talking about <laughs> I was in a little room. I was in a little room. It was Oh it, man. It was a Reddit thread, I believe. And <laughs> and people were talking about 
Is it normal to feel crappy after your mid 30s? And like, what are you actually dealing with day to day? Like, I've got this back pain. I've got this knee ache. I can't touch my toe. Like, everyone was kind of like voicing their body complaints. Yeah. And I was just thinking, wow, like, I just feel really fortunate that I'm 44 and I have the odd tweak here and there, the area that feels tight, of course, but day to day, like I can just walk around and have a normal life and feel good. And it makes sense because if your life is walking and sitting and not a whole lot of bending and stretching and moving and getting into weird positions, then those it's like a use it or lose it type of situation. Yeah. I, if I, I mean, the question, is it normal to have all these aches and pains at 30? The answer is, uh, in 2022, yeah, it's normal, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, 200 years ago, it's not that normal. Yeah. Um, Because 200 years ago, life demanded a lot more movement, a lot more, you know, it was was not as sedentary and as, uh, you know, limited in in movement. You know, go back thousands, 10,000 years ago, it's definitely not normal. We're, we're, you know, the best lubricant that your joints could ever have is not an oil, a pill, a curcumin. A, it's just going and moving. Mm-hmm. If you move all the time, you'll be, you'll be good to go. Yeah. And I mean, now we have to manufacture that movement in the gym. Right. Right. That's, I mean, that's just the truth of it. And I have trained 45, 60 minutes a day, a few days a week, and I've trained three hours a day, many days a week, most days of the week. And, you know, depending on how hard you're pushing yourself, like more movement has always felt better. And uh, that's because of the, you know, it's the use it or lose it mentality or or, mm-hmm. or not mentality, uh, like the law of use it or lose it. Like sure. your body is not, is going to deteriorate with less movement. So there's no bad postures. There's just, not moving. Yeah. It's like, oh, I have this horrible posture from sitting at my desk. It's like, no, 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 no. You sit at your desk. That's the bad posture. It's not because you're like desk was at the wrong height yeah. or like your, your shoulders or like the keyboard was in the wrong position. It's because you're freaking sitting there all day. Mm-hmm. You know, get up and move, get up and move. Like I, I think, I mean, I'm not saying we should sit, Right. But like, I got all caught up in like, should I have a standing desk? Should I have a sitting desk? Like, what's the best position? Mm -hmm. It's like, just don't be at your desk for 10 hours a day. If you can, I I know I'm simplifying this and that's not most people's lives. Like there's a lot of people that are connected to that position, but you know, the best mitigation is get up and move. Not, okay, I got to like find the the best place to just be static. Like Mm -hmm. if I, if I roll my shoulders back, if I move my laptop, if I move it up a little bit, if I change my screen, if I... If I get into a position where I can really just lock in for 10 hours, I'm going to be fine. It's like, no, that won't, that won't be the right solution. Yeah. I just watched the movie WALL-E with my kids and there's like a scene where everybody's in the spaceship and they've been on there for like 20,000 years waiting for the earth to regenerate. And everybody's just this big blob and they're just like riding around in their chair, (laughs) like just drinking their liquid nutrition. It's like, (laughs) they don't remember how to walk out. I watched, I saw a shark tank episode last night where they, the, the tool or like the little gadget was, a like a, it was like a little, it was imagine like a, a little miniature chopstick that like went between your fingers. It was like a pincher type uh-huh. of, so you could put this little pincher in between your fingers. That way you could type longer. You could stay at your desk and you could use it to grab snacks <laughs> so that you wouldn't get gunk on your fingertips and on your face and on your shirt. You could keep it in the, it was called like the snack sticks or something. <laughs> oh the snacks, this, Kevin, Kevin Hart, got the deal <laughs> he was like i love it i love it <laughs> anyway i was like no oh, let's let's not why don't we get up and go and <laughs> walk down the street and you know grab a food and take a 10 minute walk and then come back and knock it out like yeah, yeah. snacks that's the that snack is, stick is not snacks the way not winning you anything <laughs> It's making money making and it's keeping money. those fingers from getting all cheesy. <laughs> Mark Cuban jumped in and was like, yeah, my kids won't use my computer 
because it's so nasty oh, that's from having so much stuff. He's like, they bought me a new keyboard because my keyboard was getting so nasty. I'm like, geez, bro, like <laughs> lay off the cheesy puffs. Just get <laughs> Anyway. Okay. Well, this really brings me to a great pair of questions, I think, which a lot of people wanted to know how to make mobility more fun. And a lot of people wanted to know, like, how long do I need to do it for? And how long do I need to keep doing it for to like, get my results to stay? And so I feel like this little package of questions really speaks to me to a potential shift in mindset that might be needed. Mm -hmm. And trying to change the narrative from mobility just being this homework assignment this yeah. dull dreaded homework assignment that you must sit in these uncomfortable positions for minutes a day. How can we rewrite that? Hmm. Wow. That's heavy because, because part of me is going to say, you know, when I spoke to Adam, oh, I've spoken to Adam about this a lot. Adam's, you know, our, you know, coach on our team who's the physical therapist who's helping us, develop a lot of the mobility protocols inside of our programs he's like you know we just we basically just have to get people to stretch more you know and it's there's not a lot of this like secret like if you if if three days a week you like literally just sit in a forward fold and try and touch your toes for five to ten minutes like you're going to see dramatic improvement if you get in the couch stretch for five minutes two three times a week you're going to see massive improvement it's just, you know, what's the, how much do you need to do? There's no getting around. Like you have to spend time in these positions. Um, the approach to mobility should not be, how do I like, how do I make this more, um, how do I make this more fun or how do I make this like go faster? It's like, how do I do it right? And if I do it right, how does it make me feel? It's like, what's the hack to like my nutrition? It's like eat real food, eat, you know, protein and fruit and vegetables. And you know, that's it. Like, Oh, but it doesn't taste good. It's not as like, it doesn't, it's not as good as like, if I have like a, this crazy recipe or if I grab something fast or it takes time, it's like, I know, but do it and do it for like a period of time. And then you get to experience like, wow, this feels amazing. It's totally worth my time. And that's the thing with mobility or the approach that we're talking about of combining strength and mobility and kind of creating this harmony between the two is that I don't think people have given it a try. They've even given it like a full effort to see like, damn, that makes a difference. If I just do the persist warm up and the FBB cool down, which can take five minutes on the front of your training and about eight minutes on the back of your training, if I just do that, holy smokes, it makes a tremendous difference. If I squat ass to grass with half the weight on the bar and hold the pause and do the tempo right and then do that every week, whoa, I, my hips feel better. My posture feels better. You know, we're fortunate to have enough customers and enough clients that we get a percentage of them that are like rule followers and they do everything. And when those people that do everything do the program, they write to us with, Hey, guess what? Like I actually feel and look taller. I, my, my posture has improved dramatically just from adding in these warm ups and cool downs. I didn't change anything else, but like I'm taller now. I feel, I feel and look taller. It's like, yeah, this stuff is, it's not, it's, there's no secret to it. It's like, you just got to get into the positions and hold them. So I think we have a great approach to it, which is sort of micro dosing these things. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should go and do your training and then go and have to do another 30 minutes of something else. I think it should be woven into your training. I think it should be part of the exercise selection. Like somebody might say like, Hey, Marcus, like the best back developer is like, the T bar row and you should do that twice a week, just super intensely. And I'm like, okay, well maybe we'll do it once a week and then we'll do, you know, lat or dumbbell pullovers and we'll do 
you know, face pulls. Why? Because those other two exercises add a different level of strength balance and mobility to the shoulder. And if we're going to do this for 20 years, like let's get a bit of both and let's make sure we weave in the full range or the mobility and strength training protocols into training that keep you feeling good, that make you want to come back and do T-bar rows in 15 years, right? Because you can do T-bar rows two, two, three times a week and build a big old back for the next three years. And then you're gonna be like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I feel tight. I feel my shoulders feel like crap and I'm over it. Yeah. Or you could do it once a week and do it for the next 20 years. And like, I'm in that, I'm in that camp. Like, yeah, I did, I did heavy cleans today. I won't do them tomorrow and I won't do them until maybe next Friday, you know, once a week, touch it. And then let's get back to doing all the balance work. That's going to keep us in the game. Yeah. I think that's been working really well for me personally, because it just feels like training. It's like, I'm in the gym. I can't really define a moment when my training shifts from mobility to training even, because I might have, today I did some toes elevated dumbbell Jefferson curls in my warm up. Well, that's some mobility, but there's a little bit of strengthening in there. I did some back squats at tempo. I might have some step ups and just different things woven in through yeah. the whole thing and then some stretching at the end. And that's my training session. So yes. I feel like that there's something about contextualizing it with this is all for your physical development and for your health. Mm-hmm. And so it's not this extra homework assignment yeah. that you're less likely to just make room for in your hugely busy day. I totally agree. And, and I think that one of the reasons, you know, probably about six months ago, I made a very concerted effort to start identifying and labeling parts of the training inside of persist programs um, to help the thinking athlete, our, our customers see, okay, this is what the intent of this is. This is what the intent of this is. There's often a, <clears throat> a warm up pre fatigue section of training. There's also a conditioning and a cool down section of training. And then sandwiched in the middle is some absolute strength and some strength balance. Absolute strength could be a lot of things, but that's kind of the the portion of training where we're trying to elevate or push our, our upper limits through thoughtful progressions. The strength balance work is kind of when our athletes know, okay, the pressure's off. I'm not trying to crank the heavy weights. The purpose of this is to explore my range of motion, explore my, my ability to move. And for me, it's always the time where I kind of, I, I'm, I kind of look forward to it. I'm like, okay, the, the, the hard expansive strength, the absolute strength stuff is going to feel tough. Yeah. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to fight for this if I want it to go up, but then I can get into the next portion of training and just sort of, okay, I, I'm going to take the pressure off and I'm just here to get great range of motion. And today in my training, I kind of took some liberties to like change the movement a little bit. Cause I'm like, this is going to feel really good. It was a split squat, the strength balance call for split squats. And I did like a kind of a, a, a different variation with a slant board and knee over toe. And I kept it light, but I just did a couple more reps and it was like, okay, I'm getting good hip and a hip flexor and calf and ankle stretch and knee stretch. And that was like great for me. And it was all range of motion work, you know, a loaded stretch felt terrific for me after doing heavy back squats. Yeah. Well, any particular go do this, try this <laughs> kinds of derivative actions that we can advise people if they're, especially people who are on the fence about like, eh, like, do I really need to do it? And it kind of feels like extra. You know, if it's not, if, if you're not feeling broken or if, if you're like crushing it and you're feeling amazing, then I wouldn't bother, you mm-hmm. know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry too much about it Um, because what that means is that you probably have decent mobility and you're probably approaching your training thoughtfully and the training itself is supportive of keeping adequate and healthy ranges in your tissues. And that's great. Then don't go overboard. If you feel like you're, you have a propensity to get tight or have little aches and pains, there's a good, that, that to me spells like, you probably um, 
maybe have some imbalances or you just like to push yourself really hard and you know you'll push yourself even if it means you know cutting range of motion a little bit short or you know you'll you'll make some sacrifices to get more intensity which i understand too if that's you then the the added mobility pieces of like doing our prep and our cool down sessions inside of persist are going to have a huge impact on keeping you out of the funk, out of the pain, and you know, reducing the number of times where you overdo it and you have to stop and and take a break from training. So that could be that could be you. And of course, if you're experiencing uh, some pain or you're experiencing some inability or some dysfunction or some range of motion limitation where you can't do a movement that you really want to be doing then you're in the category of people that are probably very motivated to do this. Like you're not on the fence. You're like, just tell me what to do. Like yeah. I'm ready to do it. Cause I hate feeling pain and I hate not being able to do the, the exercise that everyone else seems to be able to do. I want to be able to do that. So if, if you're in that category, then for sure, like jump on board, check out the persist recovery tools that we have. They're legit and they will guide you to a good place. If you're feeling no, pain or no issues and you're loving life and training's great then don't worry about it but if you're that person that's kind of in the middle uh that likes to push themselves pretty hard and you know you kind of build up these dysfunctions over time um it could definitely extend your you know give you a little bit more sustainability where you can train more uh, effectively over time and you probably will see fewer plateaus if you can maintain these positions better yeah awesome well, I'm really excited to add the recovery library that yeah. we're going to be putting into Persist soon. We'll have an area on our website for Persist subscribers that will have all of our mobility videos and some protocols in one place. So yeah. they'll be easy to access if you want to do them outside your training. Or you can just follow the program for the day and they're baked right in. Yeah. And I really am looking forward to when we do a recover challenge at some point because... Yeah. I'm not somebody who needs a nutrition challenge to be like dialed in or like a cardio challenge to like do my, you are the cardio challenge, <laughs> but I, I, I am, but I could definitely, I could definitely use a challenge, uh, to, to dial in some mo mobility. And, um, so yeah. Hey, if you guys like the sound of that, give us a thumbs up. Maybe we can do a stretch along party, silent disco. <laughs> oh, sick. Oh my God. That would be fun. Oh my God. Oh my God. This is so cool. All right. Well, thanks for joining us and we'll see you on the next one. See you next time.